Hi, my name is Jay, and I'm here to tell you about the neuroscience of cooperation research that my lab has been doing at NYU. As you all know, the world is composed of groups and teams, uh, whether you're talking about political partisan groups, uh, work groups and teams in scientific community, at schools or in the lab. Um, fundamentally, we need to figure out how to cooperate to succeed. The problem, of course, is that cooperation often requires that we figure out a way to get around self-interest. Uh, because when people are all acting in a self-interested way, it can have catastrophic consequences. This is the type of problem that we see, uh, obviously, with climate change. You can see the data here over time. If none of us pay attention to this collective concern and each optimize our own individual self-interest or hedonic interests, uh, we get this catastrophic change in the global temperature. This also happens for scientists. Uh, if you try to optimize your individual gains and you publish work that is, uh, you know, p-hacked or flimsy, it might be just enough for you to get a paper and a journal article and advance your own career. But if an entire scientific literature is built on these types of individual decisions that optimize self-interest, uh, the collective suffers and we end up with a literature that's untrustworthy. Now, how can we understand what motivates people to cooperate and what are the barriers? This is not a new idea and this is dates back you know, hundreds of years to people observing the way that humans interacted with one another. Uh, I'm quoting here from Hobbes, who famously said that life is nasty, brutish, and short. What he was talking about is something uh, very dark at the heart of human nature. And he thought that we needed a Leviathan or some agency or uh, institution to step in to regulate us because life was nasty, that we might be predisposed so much to self-interest in an aggressive way that it could harm the collective if we didn't find ways to regulate it. And if you look at our uh, close cousins, the chimpanzees, they live incredibly violent, aggressive lives. Uh, violence not only to uh, other groups of chimps, but also to members of their own groups. And they form coalitions for political power uh, that are grounded in, in aggression. But of course, if you look at uh, the chimpanzee's close cousin, the bonobo or the pygmy chimp, um, what you see is that their life is very different, that they actually have a structure that is incredibly cooperative. Uh, and now both of these are our close ancestors, so it's hard to figure out where to draw uh, the right analogy. Um, are we these uh, hyper-aggressive chimp-like instincts grounded in our basic biology, or are we closer to the bonobos in terms of our underlying nature? Uh, Rousseau came along you know, a, a few hundred years after uh, Hobbes and argued that we are much more like bonobos, although he didn't really uh, understand anything about bonobos, but his observation is there's nothing so gentle as man in his primitive state, which is the idea of a noble savage that in our basic state, uncorrupted by institutions, uh, we actually are incredibly pro-social and cooperative. And so these are kind of the two frameworks uh, from evolutionary biology or from a you know, long history of philosophy that captured this tension between trying to understand uh, what is the nature uh, of humans? Are we self-interested or cooperative? And the way this has been looked at in, in the cognitive sciences uh, is trying to understand whether you know, our aspects of cooperation are driven by our intuitions, this kind of Rousseauian uncorrupted uh, state of human nature, or does it require deliberation? Uh, is it, does it look a lot more like Hobbes where we have to regulate our behavior to cooperate? Uh, and that it's much more effortful and it doesn't come naturally or intuitively to us. Um, and, and this has been debated in a long literature. Uh, there are many models that argue that cooperation is deliberation. In other words, that by thinking and using our, our large uh, lateral prefrontal cortex, we can make the right choices to be pro-social. Um, of course, there are competing models uh, and, and prominent papers in developmental literature and behavioral economics that suggest it's quite the opposite, that when we're not thinking or when we're responding quickly, we're cooperative. And when we stop to engage in deliberation, we're more self-interested. And so um, this is one of the most prominent papers on this uh, by Dave Brand and Josh Green and Martin Nowak suggested that when people are under time pressure to make a quick decision, that their rate of cooperation is higher on public goods games. And when they were asked to delay or deliberate and wait and think for at least 10 seconds, that they were uh, less cooperative. Um, however, this finding has been difficult to replicate. And so many labs have tried. In fact, there was a registered replication report in my lab. Uh, Julian Wills and I tried to replicate it at NYU. Um, and the results were incredibly mixed. 
And so whether or not there is uh, an effect here really depends on how you treat a very large number portion of outliers, uh, who, people who don't follow the instructions. And so if you remove that huge sample, which is roughly half of the sample uh, from the analysis, you find this intuitive cooperation effect. If you don't, then it's gone uh, completely. And so there is a lot of ambiguity about how to understand these findings. And uh, there's an ongoing debate about this. And by the way, here's the lab at NYU. You can see that uh, in under time pressure, uh, New Yorkers are not intuitively cooperative, unfortunately. Um, they're one of the least cooperative groups. And so this inspired Julian and I and our collaborators uh, to think about what we can learn by looking underneath the hood. And so there's a long history of trying to understand how certain brain regions, in particular brain damage, are related to cooperative decisions. This dates back to Phineas Gage, probably the most uh, famous neuropsych patient in, in history. And we uh, brought in lesion patients in the New York area who had damage to similar regions to Phineas Gage, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, or to regions involved in uh, deliberation, like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, as well as other regions involved in affective decision-making and intuition, uh, like the amygdala, as well as brain damage controls and, and healthy patients. And what you see here from this da data, and this is from people with fully clean lesions or not, um, in the healthy controls, people cooperated about 40, 45% of the time on average, although there was a lot of variation. Um, among brain damage controls with damage to other areas of, of the brain, they cooperated at almost the exact same rate as healthy control. So brain damage per se doesn't change your rate of cooperation. Um, and what you find here is that people with amygdala damage were cooperating at similar rates, although a, a tiny bit lower um, than healthy controls. And what you see here is these are our clean uh, lesion patients that people with ventral medial prefrontal cortex damage cooperated nearly 100% of the time. And people with dorsolateral prefrontal cortex damage uh, this one individual had uh, focal damage in this region, cooperated 0% of the time. So it was 100% self-interested. And so what this suggested is that maybe the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is necessary um, and maybe deliberation or part of those uh, regulatory processes are necessary for cooperation. Um, we also looked at people who had partial damage in that region and did a continuous regression. And what we found is that uh, consistent with those data of the clean lesion patients, um, the more damage you had on average to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, um, the less you cooperated on average. So we found this uh, in, in both ways of, of carving up the data, triangulated on the same story, that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex seems to be necessary uh, for cooperation. And if you have damage there, and the more damage you have, the less likely you are to give to the group in a public goods game. So in other words, cooperation decreases the more damage you have to that region. Um, amygdala damage was negligible. And if anything, ventral medial prefrontal cortex damage was associated with more giving. Um, and so it suggests that there might be something to this restraint-based model of cooperation rather than the intuitive model of cooperation. Of course, as we've been thinking about this more and more and engaging with the neuroeconomics literature and other literatures, um, we've been thinking that this dual process model is probably not the most powerful way of thinking about things. As we know, once you look under the hood, it's hard to chunk the brain into two processes. There's uh, numerous different processes and damage to different regions have different uh, behavioral consequences and cognitive uh, mechanisms underlying them. And so we've been thinking that uh, what matters more for cooperation are factors that increase the value of cooperation. Um, and so one of those key factors uh, based on anthropological work around the world um, suggests that culture might matter. And in fact, it might matter a great deal. And so this is work by Joe Henrik and colleagues and they've given economic games to all of these uh, cultures in different parts of the world. And what they found is that uh, norms seem to differ a great deal about how much to give people in economic games, whether you should uh, be equitable, whether you should give more than half of the money to them or reject it. Um, they have looked at these in a number of different games. And the main take home point is that these, there isn't really like a singular element of human nature driving cooperative decisions in these economic games it seems to be heavily driven by local norms. Um, and, and this is what neuroeconomists have suggested as well, that human cooperation has uh, really grounded in normative decisions. We look towards others to determine whether or not we should cooperate. And so we tried to come into the lab and manipulate this uh, causally by having people interact with different cultures. Um, so in the same context, uh, even if you take people within the same country or, or same region, um, you can manipulate experimentally the degree of cooperation and see, see if that changes uh, individuals' behavior and also the way that they mentally compute decisions to cooperate and whether in particular it changes uh, signals associated with the value of a decision to cooperate with a group. 
And so we told participants in our lab um, that they were gonna interact with students from two universities and we didn't tell them which universities because we didn't want their stereotypes about different universities uh, to weigh in. So we told them there are gonna be two universities, X and Y. And uh, in one university, we told them that there's gonna be, we didn't tell them which university, but we said one university tends to have people who are more cooperative, uh, or sorry, less cooperative and the other university tends to have people who are more cooperative, but we didn't tell them which. They had to learn by playing and interacting with these individuals over multiple trials. And so we had them play a number of one-shot trials against different people from these ostensible universities. Uh, and we had real monetary decisions here. So this was incentivized choice uh, to see, does their actual behavior change in terms of their goal to maximize their own outcomes at the end? Um, and in every, in all these studies, by the way, it's in the, always in your best interest to keep, because even if everybody else cooperates, you get your money plus a share of the group's uh, money. So there's always, um, in these situations, uh, the, the balance is tilted towards uh, self-interest and you're essentially seeing what can shift people into uh, a giving mode. And so we had people do 100 trials across four blocks and in each block, they cooperated with a bunch of uh, students from a different university. So one block would be 25 trials cooperating with one university and then they would shift to make decisions to cooperate or, or keep uh, against 20, 25 trials against students from another university. And what we found on average is that, again, in our New York example, the mean level of cooperation was not high. It was roughly 32% uh, of the time people cooperated. But what we found critically was that cooperation dramatically changed behavior, even in this incentivized task, uh, such that cooperation nearly doubled when people were interacting with the more cooperative university. And again, we counterbalanced which color is associated with cooperation here. And, and they had to learn it on their own. So at first, the rates of cooperation towards both universities are the same. And as they played more and more and they learned the norms and were paying attention to the norms, um, their cooperation completely uh, was almost completely or doubled uh, in, in a way that doubled the rate of cooperation roughly towards uh, when they're interacting with a cooperative group. So the norms mattered a great deal here. Um, the other thing we, we found when we uh, looked at the data was that when they were cooperating with students from a cooperative university, so in other words, when they were cooperating with cooperators, we found uh, activation of the MPFC here. And so this suggests, and then, you know, this is consistent with uh, neuroeconomic models of, of value-based uh, decision-making. Um, and then when we found that they were cooperating with defectors, so when they were interacting with the university full of students who were less likely to cooperate, so only cooperated at a 30% rate, um, it, was, it seemed to be more effortful. So in that case, you saw um, what looked like on this effortful type of cooperation. And that's where it seems like the DLPFC is, is uh, required. Uh, and fo it follows up our lesion paper by suggesting that part of the reason we might find that data uh, in our lesion sample is because uh, people are coming in in a context in New York where the average rate of cooperation is pretty low. And so in that context, cooperation is more effortful. You have to overcome the tendency to defect or be self-interested. Um, but even those same people in that same city um, can shift the mental computations that underlie cooperation if cooperation is valued because they're interacting with other cooperators and the norm is different. Um, and so here you can see the model uh, continuously um, as the proportion of give trials increased, um, the beta that we saw in the VMPFC increased uh, for give trials as opposed to keep trials. And you see the opposite in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And so um, it's not just at the, at the group level, you see this uh, within individual participants as the rate of cooperation changes. Um, and this is actually really consistent with a value-based model of decision-making uh, that came out by uh, Krybeck and colleagues. They had a paper in Nature Communications a few years ago, also arguing against the dual process model um, by showing that reaction time, so in other words, the speed in which you give changes as a function of the number of uh, self selfish uh, decisions you have. And so more selfish people cooperate, or, or sorry, are selfish quicker and take longer to cooperate, and more cooperative people cooperate quicker. And so this notion that people are intuitively cooperative as, as part of human nature or intuitively self-interested seems to be wrong. It seems to really hinge on individual differences in your normal uh, rate of cooperation and uh, the norms of the current context you're in. And so this suggests that, uh, at least our data suggests that social norms matter a great deal for the value people place on cooperation, people are incredibly flexible to these norms. Even within the same city, uh, you know, people who aren't very generous can quickly shift their rate of generosity in a pretty dramatic way the moment that they're interacting with cooperative people. And then 
you know, a minute later they switch blocks and they're interacting with people who aren't cooperative and their behavior shifts really quickly. And so there is a flexibility and a, a great sensitivity to norms. And this suggests really the need to be, be, be in our data and other work that I, that I cited here to move beyond dual process models and think about pro-social tendencies like the Crybeck paper or the role of group norms uh, and sensitivity to those norms and the identities we have. And so I don't have time to get into it, but we've also manipulated group identities in people uh, collectively solving problems and measured EEG data and looked at behavioral cooperation. And, and we found the same uh, similar pattern that even when you're interacting with people, uh, your decision to cooperate is determined by whether or not you feel like you're part of a team with those individuals. Uh, in other words, you share a, a social identity with them. Uh, and if you are working with them, but you don't share a social identity, um, then you're less likely to cooperate with them. And so this seems to also be a critical role. And so this is another context factor that seems to determine uh, whether norms are useful. And so whether or not people get on the same page in, term, in terms of uh, synchrony um, also seems to matter for collective decision-making in these, but only when they're thinking about themselves as a group. So I'll encourage you to read that paper. I don't have time to get into it now. Uh, but the bottom line here is that, as you might expect, uh, philosophers speculating on this hundreds of years ago are, are, are wrong. <laughs> um, the data suggests it's more nuanced than that. Um, and so both have a kernel of truth to them. Um, and that we can act uh, cooperatively, uh, you know, in a, in a way that aligns with Rousseau or our cousins, the bonobos. Um, but that only tends to happen when we're in a context or among people where value is placed on collective outcomes. We share an identity, the norms of cooperation are great, or we just have a strong individual difference of prosociality. And so it's a possibility that you could go either way. And so this is why uh, structuring the social situation might matter a great deal when we think about how we're gonna solve some of these uh, problems that are fundamentally social dilemmas that require cooperation. With that, I'll thank you and I'll look forward to your questions.